it's not only the case that like, you know, people are considered irredeemable, but it's that some people are considered irredeemable and some people aren't. Um, and that just unfair application of uh, rules or social structures or norms or whatever you want to call it, that is what I think a lot of people have issues with when they talk about things like defunding the police. Everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Citizens Gambit. Um, this is Suheb Qasim and I'm here with Ojis, our co-host. And so if you listen to the intro, you know that the first topic that we'll be discussing is the current movement, if you would call it that, uh, to defund the police. And so that is what we'll be talking about. And so we'll be going into a little bit about the history, um, what it sort of what form it's taken now, what politician, where politicians stand on it right now, and um, and some other adjacent issues related to, um, to policing in this country. I think it's worth addressing that, that the events that gave rise to these, um, to these calls to defund the police um, were you know, tragic. We just did not want to make an episode about this, the murder itself. I mean, it's quite self-explanatory. Um, and you know, the egregiousness of the action was, is something that we don't really think is necessary to restate. Um, I think we've been, I think we know, you know, enough about it and how evil it was. So we, we just wanted to start by talking a little bit about what, um, what actually gave rise to the, the militarization of the police in the first place. Um, and so just, do you want to talk a little bit about, about what you know about that? Yeah, uh, this is a great introduction. Um, so let's get into a little bit about uh, how the police got so militarized in the first place. So honestly, we can trace um, we can trace militarization as far back as the Civil War. You know, we always say that the police is this um, tool that's supposed to help us, that's supposed to protect us during our times of crisis. But to be honest, the history of the police has more been about enforcing political will over the citizens um, in any manner of ways. Uh, and silencing protests or protesters or dissenters than it has been protecting um, our streets and our homes and our livelihoods. And so really the first um, signs of militarization of the police can be traced to the Civil War. So post, uh, during the Reconstruction period mainly. Um, so during a lot of that time, you know, you see uh, the police, um, they were deployed in the South mainly in the South. And um, you see them exerting um, the political will of the North over, um, over the reconstruction of South. And however you feel about that, which obviously, you know, we, we have the, um, the lessons from the Civil War and we take those very seriously. And um, the, the intent of the police to enforce that will is still wrong. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. Um, yeah. We see that again in the 1960s with uh, Lyndon B. Johnson and um, the omnibus crime control. So he, this is where you actually start to have the police um, actually getting their weapons from the military and, and using them to specifically suppress riots. Now it's not just about enforcing a political will, it's about dominating um, the populace and, and the public and, and really uh, I guess, um, suppressing any sort of dissent. Um, you again see this, of course, during Nixon and Reagan, so the war on drugs, which of course, as everyone knows, if you're following the elections, you've seen how uh, Biden also supported those and actually egged on Reagan's war on drugs, um, along with the crack cocaine problems and the 1994 crime bill. Um, when you get to the war on drugs, this is actually where you get to things like civil forfeiture. So where uh, the idea that you can just confiscate stuff from suspected drug dealers, um, and you also get things like they buy more uh, military equipment from the Pentagon uh, and things like that. Um, of course, I think the biggest, uh, um, I don't know how to say this properly. 
the biggest <laughs> like move, uh, movement towards militarization was probably done after 9-11 um, with the Patriot Act, of course, that we all know. This is what really turned the police more into soldiers and in and they were police. Um, Patriot Act, by the way, which was just reauthorized by Congress, including the Democrats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. Thank you for getting to that. So Democrats actually, as part of um, government, uh, as part of funding the government passed uh, December 20th, 2019, they have um, also extended the Patriot Act. So uh, I think that the uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus tried to lobby for some changes and things like that. They were ultimately overruled and strongholded by um, Democratic leadership. Um, and in terms of the rallies, I mean, what's so interesting is that it's, a lot of it is, it's, it's really just a lack of leadership ability within the police. And, and, and I'm going to get into this a lot later, but the problem with, I mean, more than just with the racism that obviously exists within the individuals, I mean, it's also just the, whole, the, the training is just extremely lacking. And if you look at the way the police are trained compared to people who are in the Navy SEALs, or people who are in, um, in the Marines, there is a unanimity to the mission, to the goal, whatever with whatever they, they do, wherever they go, they have an end goal in sight. And with police, what you see a lot of times with these rallies is that they you have one group over there who's meant to suppress these people. And then you get orders from somebody else who did not give orders to that guy, giving orders to these people to say to do something completely different. And that's, again, why you see this cycle of just, you know, people are, are angry at the police and then they go and they exercise their right. And then the police, as a response, have to, have to I guess, push back, which then leads to more of this, you know, of this crazy cycle that we're seeing um, and that you described happening over the, over the decades um, in history. Um, and so besides that, though, we should talk about the role that unions have had. Um, in allowing police officers to keep on doing what um, what they've been doing, what has been becoming popularized now, because police unions have been um, put under fire for a long time, actually, and they're they're supposed to be no different from other from any other labor union, right? I mean, the 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 goal is to represent the members and advocate for for fair treatment. Um, you know, the problem with police unions is that they're they're helping many of the cops that are bad and getting fired justifiably um, get their jobs back. And, you know, they use whatever, whatever the tools necessary, right? Secretive appeals, um, you know, that are geared to protect labor rights instead of public safety. And that's the thing about unions, about the police unions specifically, is that you have unions which are meant to protect labor rights, but in the case of police, the labor is, um, is life threatening. And so that's the problem is that you have this sort of crossover. And, you know, a lot of times what the, what the labor, uh, what the um, police unions are fighting for is not always, you know, it's not always going to be the most humane because we're dealing with, with such, you know, with such heavy jobs. Um, and so, you know, you have a lot of these unqualified cops who are, who are getting put back onto the streets. A lot of cops who are, who have had, various complaints against them who are getting their badges back. Um, I go and so further than that, yeah. though, because I think that one of the most important parts, one of the problems um, is that, yes, a union is supposed to fight for the rights of the workers. But I and that is one thing that I really love about the idea of having unions in the first place. And that's what we fought or not us because we're too young, but obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the American yeah. labor force fought for, uh, you know, during the time of like Pullman and all of those guys uh, to actually get some of their rights and be treated like humans. The issue comes when you start treating them as, um, as not, not only um, human, but infallible, like you can do no wrong kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that is the issue with police unions, in my opinion, because I was, there was an, a, um, an, a beautiful article from the Atlantic back from 2014, which was called how police unions and arbitrators keep abusive cops on the street. And we'll link to all of the sources that we've put in um, to make sure that you guys can check them out as well. And, you know, see whether or not these are credible sources and give us other sources that 
are interesting and, and good. Um, but I think that they give some really good, um, good uh, examples of not only things that are like excessive force, but also um, damaging to their own, uh, too much damaging their own police. I think they're like cases of like rape and you know brutality against other police officers. And so this isn't something that's just protecting police. This is protecting police in power who want to um, exert their force over this system, right? And it goes back to this idea of who do we treat as human and who do we treat as expendable? And currently, who we treat as human are these cops that are in power, typically white males, very privileged, um, and we put them on some sort of hero status because they supposedly go and risk their lives as police, which is, by the way, something that they have signed up for. And we treat everyone else as expendable. And that is fundamentally, I think, the big issue within these police unions. It's not fighting for labor rights necessarily or the rights of the police. It's fighting for the rights of the police in power. Right. right. Yeah, I was going to say you brought up an interesting point, but just sort of the way that we, the way that we view um, police and the way that we view people who are, you know, who are supposed to bring, you know, justice and order to our streets, right? Because it's, it's fascinating to see how policy influences our perspectives of people and vice versa, you know, because I feel like one interesting reason why we see the, the pushback to the idea of less militarization and surveillance of the police, obviously not with, with on the left, but mainly on, on the, in the center and the right is that our country seems to have a very impulsive and punitive approach to non-law abiding citizens. And, you know, even if it's people who commit crimes, who I will say obviously should go through the judicial process, um, you know, they're automatically labeled as irredeemable, right? And, and you know, it's especially true of if you see drug users who, you know, they are put into into jail before they're even considered for treatment or even for just more attention. Yeah. Um, you know, so all the, all the social factors, the economic factors, the cultural factors that, um, that they're, that they're under, right. So, or that they, um, that are of their current state carry very little weight once they perform an action that is, um, against the law. Um, so that is, I mean, I, I obviously if you're against the law, you're against the law. But there is a philosophical shift that I think needs to, to happen when it comes to how people, how redeemable people are. Um, and, you know, we need to be able to understand sort of the, the economic underpinnings of, of a lot of these actions. And I think we're going to talk about this more, but what defunding the police means to some is to address those, um, those, those issues, right? Those underlying issues that, um, that lead people to do um, unlawful uh, actions, yeah. I think that it's not only the case that like, you know, people are considered irredeemable, but it's that some people are considered irredeemable and some people aren't. Um, and that just unfair application of uh, rules or social structures or norms or whatever you wanna call it, that is what I think a lot of people have issues with when they talk about things like defunding the police. Um, just going back to the example, I think uh, the example here was um, a chief, uh, police chief in, or a police officer in Lakeland, Florida, who admitted, so here it is. So they said he admitted to having sex with a colleague while in a vehicle in a city park, but denied the allegations of, you know, rape and things like that. Um, the logic, I think that the, so the guy apparently got his job back. He's now an officer and he got a year of back pay. And um, the, their logic was in the Wolverton case, arbitrator Harry Mason wrote that Wolverton received a harsher penalty than some other officers in similar situations. One of those former Lieutenant John Collins was demoted in 2012 after investigators learned he had sex with an officer applicant and appeal and appeared to aid her hiring. So it's not a case of, um, of, you know, treating these or um, immediately 
considering people irredeemable. It's that we consider some people irredeemable and some people not despite the same actions, right? And that was the issue with things like the 1994 crime bill, right? Where, you know, or like the crack cocaine um, problem where I think it was crack, which was like the less pure form or like the ground up form that was typically used by the black population was considered, was um, much more heavily, um, tracked and and you were much more heavily punished for possessing coke than you were for possessing cocaine which was i think pure or sorry crack versus cocaine which is i think pure it was used by a majority white population so you know something i think about then is where do we go from here then when it comes to police unions obviously i mean the calls to abolish police unions have not started now they've started decades ago um, but you have, you know, I know Nancy Pelosi recently said that, you know, she believes that unions, and this is a direct, do I have the direct quote? Yes, a direct quote. She said that, you know, the unions know that there are some things that have to change and they want to be a part of that conversation. And so she's open to allowing unions to be a part of the, ref of the eventual reform. Mm -hmm. um, but I fail to see how that's, how that's possible, given that the police unions are such a large part of the problem. Um, I do think that unions are important, and I don't want this conversation to be like, oh, we, you know, disbanded, or we don't believe in police unions, and therefore we shouldn't have unions across the board, because that is an argument that I do see happening, and I would just like to address that and say I am 100% in support of unions and unionized labor, um, but you also have to have a union that works for the members that it represents. Um, for every member, and, and it should be across um, whatever hierarchies or um, positions that, you know, a worker can find themselves in. It should be something that um, protects the worker, um, does not shield the worker, does not, you know, um, kind of coddle the worker the way police unions do, like a mother to, you know, you can do no harm, my son. Like, we don't want that, but we, yeah. we do want someone who will stand up and fight for our rights as, um, as laborers. Right. So, the limit police unions and labor unions is that the police unions, you know, it, it is life and death, right? I mean, the labor unions, they fight for the workers, but the, the treatment of the, or sorry, the, the, the ultimate fate of the worker does not bleed into the public at all, really. I mean, you can argue it, it may indirectly, but you know, one bad cop coming back, one bad cop being brought into the force can mean a lot of bad things. Um, and we saw that. We saw that with the Roach, with the, the Oakland officers and stuff too. So, um, so yeah, no, but I, I do agree with you. I do think that, that unions in general, labor unions, and even police unions for that matter, I mean, if, as long as, as long as they, figure out a way to get rid of those problems it's it's i i guess but i just feel like police it's so inherent um with the way that they um with the way that they work and so we'll see i mean it's it's you know we're gonna we're gonna see i guess more developments with police unions in the coming in the coming weeks i think things are moving so fast i think but, that you touched on something that was very important where you said that um like the the way that police work, police system works is like inherent. Like I think you use that word specifically. And I think that brings up a really good point, which is what do we see the role of the police as, right? Is it something where, as we have seen through history, is it something where you enforce government will or political will over the people? Is it um, a tool that you can't, because we call the police in every situation, right? Domestic violence, you call the police. Mental health issues, you call the police. Um, what, what else? Lost, you call the police. Uh, dog gone missing, call the police. So, I mean, they take over everything and we use them for our protests and things like that. And so because they have such a large function, and because part of their function is so militarized, it's no wonder that it has gotten to this point, I think. Um, and so I think we have to take time and really distill what we want the role of the police to be specifically. Right. I mean, something that I've wrestled with is, you know, do we want, is the problem that we give them too much to do or is it the problem that we don't train them 
well enough or they, we don't prepare them to do those various tasks. You know, I mean, clearly the problem is maybe a combination of both. Um, and we may get into that, into that, um, into that later, but we'll, we'll defunding the police. As I said, I think that the, the, the idea is meant to, I think for some is meant to, um, to help alleviate that, that problem, um, and make it so that, uh, some of those other extraneous, um, situations, you know, like a mental health crisis and stuff are not taken care of by police and by, are taken care of by professionals in those fields. Um, we just to what defund police actually is. And so like the movement in general, I think there are very, there are many interpretations about, of what defunding the police actually looks like. Um, and, you know, there's the more impulsive, there's the more extreme slash radical proposal, which is to abolish the police completely. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the more moderate one, which is um, really just a, a version of, of reform, which is removing some funds um, from the police departments and then putting them into uh, to other resources, such as safe housing and mental health services, homelessness, preventative care, um, and other things that are that are aimed at preventing the situations that lead us to call the cops in the first place. Um, and so the whole defunding the police movement was actually not something that started this year. It actually was after Ferguson, um, after the Michael Brown shooting, that was Michael Brown, correct? I believe. Um, after that shooting in Ferguson, that was when, this was in 2014, um, that was when defunding the police actually became more, more popular, um, but it didn't really gain steam just because it seemed so far-fetched back then, um, which tells us how far we've come um, since then. But so the defunding the police um, movement is really about, about reallocating the, I mean, if you're, if you're, let's exclude the abolishing the police. Um, we can get into that later. Um, but I think that the more pragmatic slash realistic slash politically um, interesting uh, proposal is the is the one that is allowing for the uh, the reallocation of funds. You know, we have politicians who are responding to this call, and this was really a sort of an impulsive. It actually started as a more radical proposal, which was to just get rid of the police departments, because I think people were. Um, seeing a lot of the videos on social media and we're seeing a lot of the instances in, um, in the rallies and in the uh, protests of cops who are just, you know, who are just for, for no seemingly justifiable reason um, imposing their will on, on silent protesters. Right? These are silent protesters who are not, you know, who are exercising their right. Um, and, I, and that's the main thing. Um, and yeah. I, do, I do get what part of that movement is coming from, which is the idea that um, police, their job is to protect you, no matter what neighborhood you live in. But there are neighborhoods where police won't go past sundown. And yeah. those places run like anarchy. You rely yeah. on your neighbors or, you know, be prepared for what happens. For us, mm -hmm. we live in relatively relative areas of privilege. Um, our parts of town are not so bad. Um, some of us live in the suburbs where, you know, there's very little policing, if at all. And so, and so for us, um, the police, you know, they come when we want them to. Um, and for the most part, they protect us. But for a vast majority of Americans, that is not the case. They you see police enforce their will over um, so-called uh, people of um, so-called less social value, right? Essentially working class, poor, black and brown Americans. Um, and we see the police standing up for people of higher social value, aka people like us, people who are middle class. Um, and so it's not, I think that as radical as people say, you know, defund, like abolishing the police is, I 
hesitate to agree with that because I don't think it's radical. If you live in a neighborhood where the police don't come when you call them or when you actually need their help and you see them kill your brothers and sisters, of course you're going to say that, you know, that abolishing the police is exactly what's necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I don't know. I, I would disagree with that. Because um, I think there's a difference between abolishing the police because Okay. I guess abolishing the police makes it seem like the police is going to go and never come back in any way, shape, or form. I'm for complete. I mean, I think, I think what most people, even the, maybe even some of the radical people, I don't know really what everybody thinks. Um, in fact, a lot of people I think are just angry because of what they see on social media, which is completely, you know, it's normal. I mean, you see your brothers and sisters being, you know, being um, put under harsh conditions and you obviously want things to change in a radical way, but um but what we saw with, for example, with Camden, New Jersey, which is, I know that's sort of the example that a lot of people give, that was not a complete wiping of the system. Like that, that, that was not just, they didn't just get rid of the police. So what they did was they, they, I mean, they laid off a bunch of the workers and they cut their salaries by half, but they, with that, I think they saved like a hundred thousand dollars. They saved a, a, a large amount of money just by doing that. But with that money, they were able to hire a lot more police and they just widened it um, to cover a lot more area, um, and made it so that it was not, um, so that it was not concentrated on one specific area. Um, and so they saw their crime rates actually drop or stay the same. The problem though, is that a lot of the cops that they got were, were actually not representative of Camden itself. I know Camden is, is a majority minority, um, area. Um, most of the cops that they ended up hiring or rehiring were white. Um, were white suburban cops who were really not, you know, I guess had not had never really been or worked in a place like Camden. Um, but either way, though, I mean, they did see from their restructuring a change in their in their crime numbers and whatnot. Um, but that was not through abolishing the police, right? That was through getting a complete restructuring of the of it um, and changing the way that it worked, changing the numbers a little bit. They also paid their officers less, but but either way. I understand we, we see the horrible videos. Like, I, I don't want, okay, this might sound really controversial and stuff, but, I, but um, for every video that we see of a, of a cop doing a horrible thing, which is obviously horrible, I mean, there are many, many cases, I mean, by the, you know, hundreds of them doing fine things. Um, and that's not to say that the bad ones are not too bad. It's, I'm not saying the bad apples. I'm, not, I'm just saying that, that, you know, we need to be pragmatic when we think about the way that we're going to, completely abolish the, I mean, if we want to abolish the police, um, to redo the system. Um, if we think about the poor neighborhoods where there are more, um, more instances of, of violence and of, you know, crime and whatnot, um, that's a community-based issue. That's a class issue also. Um, and so before, before we talk about the police and, and whether or not we need them, um, the police, we should think about the fact that they are really, at the, they're at the tail end of those situations, right? I mean, they, so if anything, we should be, and I know that defunding the police is meant to put more funds into the stuff that goes before that. I just don't know why we have to take money away from the police to do that. And I get that the question, the big, the big question in politics is where are we going to get the money, even though we have a lot of money um, and we usually put it in the wrong places. But honestly, I mean, these are the things I'm glad that people are talking about more funding for education and housing and all these things in these communities. But um, I think, I feel like we can have a best of both worlds approach and not have to remove the, we don't have to defund the police, which in my opinion need a little, at least a little bit more funding for training and stuff. And so I think that's the biggest problem is not the amount of money they get. It's just the, where the money is actually going within it. And now I guess you could, you could say that maybe there's some lobbying going on about where they, where the funds go, but. I would like, I mean, if we're going to talk about um, retraining or restructuring the police system, I would say fucking demilitarize it. Mm -hmm. Don't let them buy Pentagon equipment. Yeah. Don't make them the military. Why would you deploy the military on your own citizens? Right. And so, that, I think, is the main issue, and 
what, like when we talk about the amount of money that goes into being that's being spent on the police, it's not necessarily, you know, the salary of the police that's going up. A lot of police salaries are going up. People who are like chief of police, you know, superintendents, lieutenants, their salary goes up exponentially so. I'm talking about the person who like stands at the corner of like the traffic light and like helps you, you know, get your way or like gets your lost kitty out of a tree, which of course, I think it should be said that Officer Chavin or Derek Chavin, who was Chavin? Chavin? I think it's Chauvin. Chauvin? Whatever. Not important. <laughs> he, was one of, he was one of those street officers, right? But a street officer shouldn't have weapons or moves that are used in the military. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Um, that, I think, is the biggest issue about why they're talking about things like defunding the police, right? Because there is, there is a, a, a militarization of the police that is fundamentally wrong and fundamentally flawed. And that is what needs to be removed. And if that requires taking money away from police departments so that they don't buy these kinds of um, arms, so they don't get the kind of training that you'd only see in like Israeli military troops, that mm -hmm. should be it. Right. Um, and so I think that there are fewer good cops. I, I don't know if that makes sense, right? I think that having a good cop, the way that you describe it as like for every video of, you know, one police brutality or one shooting or something like that, you see all of these other people supposed that you, you see all these other acts of kindness from the police around you. Right, right, right. I think that those acts of kindness are anomalies or they are only reserved for people who are considered socially worthy. Hmm. And they are not seen for a vast majority of Americans. Hmm. Because yeah. I think, if you remember, Derek Chauvin also had two other officers with him, who, again, were oh, also, for yeah. something like that, they were yeah. also considered good officers, right? Yeah. They had never had an issue like this in the past. But the fact that they sat there and let this happen, right. that means that this kind of treatment or subjugation is routine. And it has been ingrained in them. And they think that it's acceptable when it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing so, is, like, I said two things. The first is, I think, well, Chauvin had something like six, 17 um, complaints. Good uh, that given, was, he should have just been stopped a long time ago, but oh, have, yeah. Also it was the people, and this is, I'm not really disagreeing with you, but I'm just really more of a correction, but the people who were with him, it was, I think every single one of them, it was their first week or it was among their first month, right? So one of them, it was their fourth day on the job. Okay. Yeah. And so even if we look at the, the, the nice acts, right, the sort of benevolent acts, they might you know, we, we have to look at the intent behind them because, yeah, obviously we don't know if these are the great, if they're the, the good Samaritans, we believe. And if they really, if they really do act the same way, depending on what social um, class the people they're acting on is, is of. But, um, but I just, I, I do think, I was really just saying that just to say, you know, if we're going to look at the way that, if we're going to look at the, the act of defunding the police generally, I just feel like we need to, you know, we need to think about more, more about how to make it better and not how to remove it completely or just, or not how to potentially make it, make it worse. Right. Like, I think, I think we need to do everything that the, de that the defunding is going to fix. We need to fix, we need to, we need to put funds into what defunding is going to put funds into. Um, but I just don't know if, def if defunding it in the process is, um, is the right way to go. But I will say though, um, there was a 2017 study that asked if defunding the police actually does increase crime or not. And so what they, so in 2014, just some, for some history, um, I forgot the month, but in 2014, two officers were killed, um, by a man named Ismail, Ismaili Brinsley. And he, um, he killed two officers. Um, one was named Wenjon Liu and Rafael Ramos, but 
after this happened, there was a sort of massive reworking of the way that they were going to go about their policing. And so um, between late 2014 and early 2015, which is when what this um, study is looking at, the time frame, um, the NYPD halted their proactive policing. And what they showed was that they actually saw that during that time between 2014 and 2015, the civilian complaints of major crimes had actually decreased. Um, and this was after reducing proactive policing, right? So proactive policing, I guess, is really just any aggressive enforcement of, of low level violations. Um, and so the main, I guess this, the, the main idea behind that, uh, the takeaway rather of the, of the paper was that, you know, we probably need to rethink the way that we, um, that we perceive police legitimacy and, and authority and the enforcement of, of, of the law. Um, also, we don't really know, I will say, we don't know exactly what, you know, what else was put in place. Um, and we also don't know if this was, if this will translate from city to city. But I did think it's really interesting that, that um, removing proactive policing for that period had actually led to a lower, to a lower rate of, of complaints concerning major crimes. So yeah, and the, and the crimes were things like burglary and assault, um, larceny, um, and so, so basically nonviolent, petty crimes, petty thefts. Right, right. And so what does that tell you? I think it tells you something really interesting, which is that we as citizens typically, except for maybe some crazy circumstances, don't want to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. We will do just fine without vigilant policing or policing initiatives where we automatically see some people as a threat and others as not. And I think that that's a really important point. It's like we're better than what we get credit for. People are better than what we give them credit for. And I don't think I'm being too optimistic and too naive when I say that. Um, and I think that the idea that you know, we have to protect our society from bad people is reductive um, and quite frankly, ludicrous. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we do though. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's, I think, our, I think our image of what a bad person, like a bad civilian is, 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 is something that we need to change, frankly. Um, and I also think it's something that we need to look more into as a, again, as a class issue, as a, as an employment issue. I mean, right. Like there are so many things that will lead somebody to take certain actions, so many mental health related, um, precursors, right. To, to certain actions. So yeah, I mean, those are conversations we need to have. Um, but there are bad people. I'm like, I'm just, you know, this is not like, this is not the sort of cynic in me or anything. It's just, I mean, the facts say, I mean, there are very bad people. I do not want to abolish the, the, the local police of Englewood, um, you know, any time soon. Um, and there's a reason for that, you know? And I also just, I mean, I, I don't, I don't put it beyond, I mean, this is not, and look, it has nothing to do with my opinion on the specific people that commit the crimes, right? And I think that's something that we all need to, to, to remind ourselves of or remind each other of. Um, but it is, you know, it is a problem that there are, that, that these actions that are, as actions taking away the, the human are not things that you would want to um to be committed onto you or to be or you know or would want anyone else you know to commit yeah, i don't see i i i understand what you're saying and it's very similar to what a lot of people you know think and say already and you're not wrong right we all want to protect our property our family our um, our livelihoods, our security, our sense of security, but I frankly don't think that police involvement is always the way to do that. And I think one really good example of this is if we look at how serial killers have been taken by the police at different points in time, mm -hmm. right? If we look at people like um, Anthony Solo, right? Uh, Cleveland uh, during like the, I think, early 2000s, I think it was captured in 2007, um, he, there were several complaints from women 
who had said, this man has tried to rape me. Um, he tied me up, there was blah, blah, blah. You know, they gave a whole testimony. And there have been several instances where police have ignored those testimony. Why? Because it came from a black woman who was a drug abuser, who, uh, you know, was probably a sex worker, um, didn't have a stable job, lived in a bad neighborhood of Cleveland. And so by their accounts, she was unreliable for some reason, as if her social standing had anything to do with what had happened to her, which is absolutely ridiculous. But that is the state of policing right now. We take some people, again, we, it goes back to this idea where we take some people as expendables and other people as real people. And but is that a problem we, with the police? Is that a problem with the police? Sorry, is that a police with the police? Is that a problem with the, with the police? The, or is it a law enforcement? Go and investigate well, this. Okay. I mean, would you say it's more a problem with the courts? I mean, I would, I would assume it's... It no, because the women went and they submitted their complaints and nothing got checked into. Nothing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, I think there was like one case where it was like the straw that broke the camel's back where they finally went and, you know, decided to peek around, out of which they were, they had acquitted Sowell before. He had already been charged as a sex offender. But they were like, you know what, let's see, you know, it's probably not a big deal. And they go there and they start digging and they find 11 bodies. Yeah. yeah. But this happened not only with Anthony Sowell, it happened with Jeffrey Dahmer, where he, his uh, population was majority, um, uh, I think, white. I think, colored uh -oh. uh, male prostitutes. Oh, um, okay. So again, in the time, in, during Jeffrey Dahmer's time, homosexuality very much looked down upon, very much a taboo subject. And so again, these people weren't given the social standing or dignity, basic dignity even, that they deserved. And that fed into the police's prejudice about them. And so quite frankly, you know, the police did not do a good job at protecting these neighborhoods, at protecting these women against a predator. Yeah. in both cases. Right. And so is the police really the way to go here? Honestly? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I feel like it's, I mean, it's difficult because then it's like you need to, it needs to be replaced with something, right? Because like we can't, we have to avoid a net negative, right? And it's like, I mean, if we, if we remove the police, I don't think right now, given our, da our current data, there is any I mean, there's any proof that it'll be a net positive, you know, or a, a net, really just a net, a net, nothing, and you know, a neutral move, let alone a net positive. Sorry, that took a while to get out. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, and so, yeah, like I do, I mean, I agree that, that, that that's a problem. And I agree that the police in that case, in those cases, um, did not do the right thing. And we're not at all, you know, we're not at all trained or we're not at all, you know, well-intentioned. Um, it's just hard when we talk about past cases and the way that it translates to today, because I feel like we, obviously, I mean, I, I hate to be the, you know, we can take from it, take, you know, take it and learn from it kind of guy, because we clearly haven't in some in, in cases, but, um, but in terms of if we, I, I just think we can, we can find solutions that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating the same point I was make, but it's like we can, you know, if we increase, you know, transparency between the police and the, and the people, if we, I mean, like, you know, if we just allow more communication and more interaction between the, between the police in every situation, right? I mean, even just cops um, talking to the locals and understanding what, you know, what the deal is socially, politically, economically, whatever, um, that would be enough having cops that kind of represent their neighborhoods. Yeah, and that, exactly. Yeah. Sanders talked about a lot. I have no idea how it would be executed or how it would be any different from how things are executed right now. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, that, that was, you know, tossed around quite a bit. This idea of having police who kind of are, um, uh, that, that come from that same demographic that they're that they police or that they watch over or protect or serve um i think serve protect are kind of more where we need to go as opposed to police right um 
And going back to training just really quickly, like I'm, you know, I'm not a, I mean, I, I did martial arts when I was, you know, a kid and I've, I've done Taekwondo and Kung Fu. Your Brogan will come after you for that. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm no, I'm no, you know, I'm not doing it right now or anything, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate martial arts, but anybody who knows anything about, about combat knows that, you know, putting your knee on somebody for, you know, for nearly nine minutes is a recipe for disaster. And oh, it wasn't a flat surface. It was like a dented surface. So yeah. he had the additional weight on his neck where there was increased tension because his head was pointed up. That was right. ridiculous. Of course, you're going to, the person's going to die. What did you expect? Right. And the thing is, I mean, and so, you know, Navy SEALs train for, you know, 50 weeks, right? I mean, that's like almost, I mean, it's more than a year. And cops, you know, like, I think it's like 65% of Navy SEAL uh, candidates actually make it through the training, right? That's just how, um, that's just how grueling it is, right? Yeah, justifiably so, right? And I think it should be as much, if not more so, maybe not more so. I guess, I mean, it could be more so for cops who's more every- so, I think, because every you have, you're, yeah. you know, these are your own people. You have to be really sure if you're going to, you know, try and kill somebody. You have to be 100% sure of each action you're taking. Because again, this is, you know, your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your uncle, somebody who you are probably somehow related to. It's your fellow American citizen. It's different than fighting a different country even. Right. And this is, you know, and obviously because of, of Floyd and because of all the other um, specifically black cases of police violence, you know, we, we tend to think about this as a race issue, which it, it is in many ways. But if we talk about we should talk about it also as a police issue, which is sort of what this episode was for, um, because you know, there there are cases of of white violence as well, where with just completely inept cops. Um, and you know, the, the example I can think of is I think it was in 2016. Tony Timpa. I don't know if you right, um, remember that this incident, but Tony Timpa was a white man, um, mentally handicapped, and he was he was. Um, outside of his, I think it was outside of his mental health facility uh, somewhere, I know, Texas. Um, and he was killed in essentially the same way that George Floyd was. Um, it was not on the neck, it was on with the whole body, but the body cam footage was released last year, right? This was three years, actually, I don't know if it was released last year, but it was made pop, it was, people started to look back at it only last year, which was three years after the actual case happened. Um, and if you actually look at the body cam footage, which is so disturbing, the cops are laughing the entire time. They don't even know if he's breathing anymore. I mean, they, they have his body on and it, it goes for the however long, 10 minutes or so that it lasts. And when he stops breathing, you know, they don't even know, right? And then the main cop whose cam was on asks if it was, you know, if he was still breathing, they go, hey, uh, you know, Tony, you're all right. And he doesn't respond. And then the other cops, you can hear the three other cops are just going, they just go, oh, I think he's sleeping. And then they just kind of laugh about it. I mean, they have no idea. I mean, if you're a cop, imagine being a cop and having no idea what it's, what a dead person looks like, right? To think that a dead person is sleeping or is, or is simply unconscious or something. I mean, it's, and then they break, they, they bring the paramedic and they, take it, they give him a sedative, like they give him a sedative right away and they take his, you know, his pulse and everything. And then they obviously, they just, they see that he's, he's dead. And the, the doctor or the, the paramedic tells the cop, you know, he's dead. I don't know what you even, you know, brought us here for. And the cops were surprised. I mean, they were actually shocked that he was, you know, about what they did to him. Because, so the point is, we clearly are doing something wrong with the way that, with the way that cops are, you know. And I know that there have been some proposals for actual martial for requirements to have some sort of martial training um, for cops. Um, but I mean, more than that, though, you know, martial arts, not, it's besides just the physical aspect, it's about this, right? It's about presence of mind. And somebody like Derek Chauvin should not be allowed to do something like that for 10 minutes, right? And because the problem is that they, everybody's in that together. There are people who are watching the situation unfold. They're recording on their phones. And there's they, they're at them. The cops are, you know, they're um, even, you know, they're rookies, but in this case, but they're telling them to stand back and they really don't know what's going on. Right. They really, they really don't know what's going on. I mean, the, the Derek may, may have 
you know, he may have done this multiple times and we don't even know, but, but the point is any person who is trained with how to deal with situations like that, with how to deal with people, how to deal with intense situations would understand that, okay, let's decompress. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go to Derek and I'm going to say, Hey, Hey, what's going on here. I'm going to, I'm going to take this over. I'm going to, you know, let's just, whatever, like, let's just, let's see what's going on at least. Right. But it was done so quickly and so, um, intense and intensely that it just it shows the lack of training it shows the lack of true training right because there's a difference between just putting someone through camp and then letting them go and actually having them go through you know personality assessments and training with people with actual subjects um so anyways so that's something that we need to to really think about when we're talking i mean when we're talking about funding and stuff like this is what we should also be thinking about um, when it comes to the cops. Now, the question becomes, who's going to want to become a cop now? And you know, th that's a fear that I've genuinely had since this has started, which is, you know, I mean, what does the future look like in a society that has now become even more distrusting of the cops? Um, I, I honestly don't know. I, I mean, one can hope that we get the, the top of the top who are really dedicated um, and who really want to serve their people to, to apply. Um, but it also seems like we're in a situation where we might get the people who are the most, I don't know, the most trigger happy, the most whoever, I mean, the most um, aggressive. Yeah, um, so I don't know, I don't know. You're saying that now because there's so much backlash against cops, you don't know who's going to sign up for it. Yes, and also because governments have been, because local governments have been responding by saying we, are, we will be defunding in some way right not a complete abolishment but there have been um there have been calls by by some politicians to actually go ahead with defunding it right and so that could mean cutting a lot of salaries that could mean doing a lot of other um budget cuts but what were you saying i think that okay so i i was gonna say what is the cop uh cops the salary the cop? I think it's around 60 to 70 i think it's around 60 to 70k Oh, it's like a stable job, pretty right. average um, wage. Yeah. I'm thinking that, so I think when you said like, what would defunding the police actually look like, right? I hope it's not going to be, you take the salary of, you know, basic cops away. Um, because that would, you know, create an initiative or incentive to not be a cop, to do something else. Um, I do think that the money that would be spent on, you know, state of the art guns and things like that is not necessary. Um, and I think taking money away from, you know, having military equipment in a police force should be, um, should be eliminated. And I think that's what people mean when they say defund the police. I think the issue right now when we say things like defund the police is that it becomes so politicized. Kind of like what we say when we, uh, when Democrats say abolish ICE, which again, started out as a very fringe movement and slowly has gained more traction over time. And like the issue is that people say, oh, abolish ICE, but you know, what does that mean exactly? And, and you know, people have been so vague on what it would mean to abolish ICE, um, that people have been this vague on like what it means to defund the police as well. Um, but I think that it's a transition. I think what they do mean is that it's a transition out of heavy militarization and towards um, actual protection of those communities. Um, yeah. I hope it means that, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think generally, I mean, with I agree with the militarization thing. And what's great about the militarization thing is that you know you remove them, you remove the funding towards towards heavy duty Pentagon, you know, military style via, um, um, uh, machine. What was I going to say? Uh, armory, whatever, um, weapons and whatnot. And in so doing, you would change the definition of a cop, right? I mean, you change. You can hopefully, and this is being completely optimistic, but you may be able to change the cohort of people who end up really wanting to be a cop. Because what the problem is like nobody, it, this is the other thing we think about when we talk about who becomes a, who becomes a cop, right? And what cops really are is that it's like, most people don't want to choose a vocation that actually, that risks their lives 
and puts their, their families' lives at risk, right? And so, I mean, it's, you know, you, and so similar to, to the army, right? I mean, you get a lot of people who, um, who may be lower in the socioeconomic, you know, socioeconomic wise, um, obviously they get benefits and whatnot, but in general, just not the people who you would expect in a research lab. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I mean, if we, if we change the, the rhetoric and if we change the institution of, of, of police, of the police force, um, I think maybe, just maybe we can, we can then change who actually ends up becoming a cop and who actually ends passionate about their job as a cop. I think it also, I don't know how, how much this works as well, but I think it's also in, worth it to talk a little bit about uh, having the idea of like for-profit jails in the first place and incentivizing police to actually try and fill up those jails is also wrong because then it creates this thing of like, okay, well then any small infraction, infraction who can we put in jail? Can we stuff these and like fill it up and, you know, actually make a profit, make money off of this? Yeah. Um, and that, of course, I think also feeds into the toxic police structure that, um, that is there. Right. Yeah. And we'll definitely dive into the, um, the prison, com the private prison complex um, in a later episode, because that is something that is, is, Honestly, it's like one of the major drawbacks of our country, honestly. I mean, it, it kind of breaks my heart thinking about it. Um, but I think we should also just sort of to end this, we should talk about what, where defunding the police is right now in terms of the, the leadership, in terms of, you know, people who actually can do something about this. It's, yeah, it's hard to say just because obviously there are different um, variations of what defunding the police is, um, but most, politicians in the past have said that they are for some version of reform. Um, but if we want to think, so I, I was reading actually recently, so J.B. Pritzker, he's the governor of Illinois, he called defunding the police a poor use of words to describe what many people really want. Um, he did lay out an agenda earlier this year, though, to, um, to phase out cash bail and other, and, um, and even divert low-level drug offenders to substance use treat, uh, abuse treatment. And so, you know, it's, we don't really know where it's going to go. And again, this is just, you know, next week is going to be completely different from, from today, um, especially from where states end up taking this. Also, Trayvon Martin, who um, was another African American, um, who's actually a kid, but he was, he was also shot. Um, that was one of the more popular ones as well. Um, his mother. 2013, I think, right? Uh, I believe it was, um, but his mother is running for local office in Miami. Um, it was in, oh, you know, yeah, it was in Florida, actually. Um, but she said she's actually against just defunding the police, um, which is interesting. She said, and this is her quote, she said, I think we need more police. We need police with better standards and police with better ethics and better work habits. Um, and so, you know, that sort of touches on what we were talking about before, which is, you know, what's, how do we draw the line between, you know, no police and good police or police that we have right now and good police. Um, and so that's what she thinks about it. Rand Paul, um, who we all know, Republican, um, he said he wants to stop the federal militarization of local police departments and end no-knock warrants. Um, and so no-knock warrants obviously are one of- be progressive for a libertarian. Yes, yes. <laughs> Is Rand Paul a libertarian? Rand Paul's a libertarian. Oh, oh, I thought he was Republican. Okay. Um, but no knock warrants um, are very important because it's actually what led to the death of Breonna Taylor, um, which is, you know, another incident that was um, just absolutely awful. Um, but the last politician I want to talk about is Jacob Frey. Frey. I believe his name is Frey um, or Fry. But he's the mayor of Minneapolis, um, which is actually where the, the killing of George Floyd occurred. Um, so he was actually brought outside and into a protest. And he, then he was asked to speak. And when he was asked to speak, he was asked by a protester, I guess, are you for defunding the police? And then that person meant abolishing the police. Um, and so that was sort of a difficult situation for him. But he, and he got a lot of, of um, pushback for his comments, which is he basically said, um, he's against abolishing the police department, but he's for 
shifting the culture and through some structural reform or revamp. But again, he's, a, he's against abolishing the whole department. And so clearly based on everybody's, uh, uh, these um, specific politicians, it seems like the, the scenarios that we end up having a major, you know, shift in the way that we at least fund some of our, you know, fund some of the police departments. I don't see a complete abolishment of it, but again, we have no idea what will happen and it's still gaining steam. Um, the abolishment idea is still gaining steam. And so, and so, yeah, things are a little bit up in the air. Um, and, um, you know, and we'll, I guess we'll have to just track it and maybe we'll do an episode of what eventually happens and the re what, what might possibly occur um, through that. But it's clear that there are no easy answers here um, because you can find studies that say that lower, um, lower police involvement or lower um, hard policing actually decreases crime levels. And you can see some, some arguments against that. It's a very difficult topic. And I think it's gonna put our our um, politicians in a tough spot as well. But I mean, other than that though, I don't, um, you know, it's a big question of what's gonna happen. But yeah, Ojas, did you wanna add anything? I thought I saw you trying to ask. Uh, no, I think that everything you said is pretty on point. I did want to see if um, Michaela Wilkes had anything because she talks, I, don't know if you know who she is. She's running um, in Maryland's fifth district to uh, as a primary to Steny Hoyer, who is a um, establishment uh, incumbent Democrat um, who mm -hmm. just has not done anything for Maryland in right. the years that he's been in office. And so she actually had a stint in jail. And I know that she stands for strong criminal justice reform. And so I think that um, I was trying to see if she had anything in particular about um, about defunding the police. So far, what she seems to say is um, things, she's more interested, I think, in jail reform, like criminal justice, like how women are treated in jails and things like that. Um, and like bail and bail issues, because of course, as we know, uh, things like bail is a, are an easy way for, um, courts and the justice system and the criminal justice system, of course, to make money um, off of um, individuals who are uh, just saddled with uh, poverty and debts and things like that and who can't afford to pay um, the, their uh, bail fees. Right. Is right. Um, I don't think that she really has anything on defund the police, but you know, if I find it, I'll add it to, our, to the blog. Yeah, and I think her opinion is very important. Baltimore is, I think, I could be wrong, but I, it is definitely among the highest, um, it is among the most dangerous cities in the country. I think it has the highest crime rate um, in the country. And actually, speaking of that, um, Trump um, has recently, he, I think it was actually today, he um, gave a speech on police, um, on police reform, and he stated that 68% of all murders in Baltimore um, were without arrest. And she actually ended up uh, confirming that, <clears throat> which just tells you where we are right now. Um, you know, where we, where we go with funding is gonna, is gonna, I think shape, you know, it could shape society in a very, you know, either in a positive or a negative way. And so we're sort of at this weird- Positive way. And I hope we end up understanding um, what real threats to society are, right? Real threats to society are not homelessness, they're not drug addiction. It's not um, petty thefts and crimes. It is because those things can be taken care of and repaired. And with, it's not mental health issues because with funding, you know, obviously we can actually tackle these issues in real legitimate ways that are, that, you know, treat people as human beings and not, um, not, not um, vermin. Um, right. And right. honestly, yeah. they take them like rats. Right. It's ridiculous. Um, right. I mean, they're doing. We can, uh, yeah, right. And we can go uh, top down into those problems that are real problems, obviously. Right. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um and so i hope that you know we can move away from something like that into actual looking looking at what like the real issues are which are of course social inequalities and disparities and in terms of um wealth and um health opportunities and educational opportunities and and things like that so yeah okay well I think that'll do it for this conversation. Um, we've gone into a lot of different topics um, and these conversations are, are they're, they're needed. And um, you know, especially at a time like this, it seems like obviously we had the virus and now we have this. It's just, you know, politics is just, it's everywhere, right? And we don't even have, you know, no one is making movies, nobody's making, TV, you know, entertainment for us. So the news is our entertainment. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we're gonna be, we're gonna have a lot to talk about um, coming up. But um, that was our episode on defunding the police. We hope you learned a lot um, from it. We learned a lot from each other <laughs> um, doing this conversation. Um, and we hope to see you in the next episode. We don't know what it's gonna be about yet, but we hope you see you there. And comment and tell us on any interesting articles or things that you guys come up with um, or find. Um, and let us know what you think of the arguments and stuff that we've presented and, you know, things that we can look to and look forward to. Right, yeah, because what we're doing is we want to engage with, we want people to engage in conversations like this. And so we'll, we'll, um, we'll give a, an opportunity for people to talk about things that we didn't talk about and to go into their own discussions because that is really important right now. Um, and so, yeah, that'll be it for this episode and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.